Okay, thank you everybody. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation, Don Petrero, Debbie Corlin, uh, Dr. Gary Say too. We've had a long relationship in terms of talking together about pediatric telemedicine and it's a real honor for me to be able to be here and speak um, to you on telemedicine, something that's passionate to many of us. And I say virtually there because, well, I've been saying virtually, we've all been saying virtually there for a number of years with this telemedicine, but um, it's a, a growing topic of interest um, in the business world and the health system um, like that. So I, I'm going to talk a lot about a lot of different topics, some programmatic, some business, some a little bit of research, uh, things like that. So we'll just burn through a lot of, and kind of peripherally talk, um, touch on a lot of different topics that ho hopefully will be of interest here. Um, nothing, to, nothing to disclose. First, a really quick definition of telemedicine. I think it first started out, you know, the, just the term with telemedicine, and most of us thought of it being uh, live and interactive, um, like a Skype um, and that's still probably the most common use of it. There's another big bucket that people refer to as store and forward or asynchronous. And that's kind of like it started off with teleradiology sending images over distance. But as you know, it's cardiac echoes, it's EEGs, it's um, we're doing a lot of other study and research at UC Davis on even using it for clinical encounters like telepsychiatry, where there's a structured interview that's done and recorded, things like that, a growing part of the field. In the adult world, it's used for ophthalmology, things like that. Then there's a bigger bucket that contains a lot of things called remote patient monitoring. And this has to do with, you know, what do you call it, like a glucometer where a kid, you're monitoring their glucose and you're able to, with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, send that into a repository, make sure they're doing it, their MDIs, things like that, um, using uh, the Fitbits on folks at home, things like that. So that's kind of a bucket called remote patient monitoring that those in telemedicine or telehealth tend to kind of like uh, put under their umbrella. And a growing um, factor which is direct to consumer or direct to patient care, and that is where you can swipe a credit card or use your insurance to be able to call up a doc on your iPad or tablet or iPhone and things like that. So the whole premise, I guess, behind telemedicine, why it makes sense conceptually is that we know there's lots of study that study and data that regionalization improves efficiency and quality. You shouldn't have a hospital on every street corner, I guess, except in LA, um, uh, or close by or trauma center and things like that, because that's going to dilute the expertise. And there's been lots of work on volume outcome relationships that it makes sense to centralize things. But this model of care by its nature creates disparities because if you're not in that metropolitan area, you don't have the same access to high quality of care that those that live in those ur typically urban areas. And so the idea is that this, these technologies um, will allow you to take advantage of regionalization but at the same time be immediately at the bedside of uh, outpatient children or critically ill children in any type of setting, be it a school, a daycare center, a critical access hospital and things like that. So um, I think that's, that's kind of like the premise upon which it, the, it's based. So the use of it certainly is on the um, rise and that's reflected in, in Wall Street. And this is a graph that was put out by a Wall Street predicting firm um, for those that are wanting to invest in these technologies. And it's really kind of getting asymptotical in terms of the growth and the investment. And we're actually seeing this for those of us that are monitoring the utilization of telemedicine and things like that on a national level. It's before where it was going up 10, 20, 30 percent per year. Now we see doubling um, in certain applications. Um, a little you know, to, about UC Davis, um, I've kind of, like when I come to a place like UCLA, it's like when I married my wife, definitely kind of a step up um, out of my league. And so I, uh, one of the things that we uh, do have a lot, even though we're a smaller department like yours, we're a children's hospital within a hospital, but we have a long history of investing in these telehealth technologies. The next children's hospital north of us in Sacramento is Portland, Oregon. So we serve a, a very, very big region. It's not very populated, but you know, um, we typically hook up to um, more than 80 sites per year. Those are the dots. You can see there are some programs down south, but we know that there are programs from up uh, down south up here, seeing patients up north in the 
overlapping, intertwining is certainly growing. It's a, an adult and pediatric program, and the way that benefits us is that we kind of ride the coattails of the adult programs in terms of the technologies and the um, technical support and administrative expertise that way. So we work synergistically there. One of the benefits of a children's hospital within a hospital. We've done more than 6,600 pediatric outpatient col uh, consultations and 650 inpatient and emergency department consultations. Again, these numbers are not big at all. If you're talking about integrated health systems like Intermountain Health or Partners and things like that where they have many hospitals, they do this in a year um, and since this is since inception. So, But as a standalone small children's hospital, it's respectable. We have um, 18 different subspecialty services that use telemedicine, some of them weekly, twice a week, some of them on what we call an ad hoc basis, so you know a handful of months that way. And then it's not also, it's not just about the um, physician services, but also our genetic counselors are routinely doing it, our child therapists, psychologists with our, um, within our Mind Institute at UC Davis are using it, our audiologists have been using it. Um, our nurse practitioners uh, for cleft lip, cleft palate, lactation consultants have done, you know, intermittent consultations to sites because they know that they can get this expertise over telemedicine if they have a telemedicine unit in their hospital. Um, PM&R, th their therapists, and we use the technology for hospitalized children, <clears throat> like a lot of hospitals do with iPads and things like that, so they can connect, connect to family members. So we're really trying to use the technology anywhere that healthcare is delivered that you can use these technologies. So a brief slide on it being used for outpatient telemedicine. I think that everybody recognizes that this is the bread and butter. So for us, rather than having a family drive three hours to see our subspecialist and pay six bucks to park, they can go to their local pediatrician or family practitioner's office and see our subspecialist in a clinic that way. And it certainly is patient-centered. There's a lot of data in a lot of different arenas in the pediatric and the adult world that it increases quality. A lot of this is thought to be uh, uh, come from better coordination from the primary care provider than the, the um, specialist, right? So rather than having to send a letter or fax a letter, or whatever, email a letter that the primary care provider may not receive. The encounter happens synergistically with those providers. They're up to date with what you're doing. The medical home is more maintained that way, um, and there's been studies to demonstrate that results in different quality. <clears throat> it also has the ability to increase capacity. We know there's workforce issues with our um, primary care providers and some specialists. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called Project Echo a little bit later where it's using these technologies not necessarily to, not necessarily to deliver specific patient care but to educate primary care providers so that they can help unburden the, the kind of what would be considered bread and butter subspecialty service um, application. And then there's some things the hope is that as these technologies get more affordable and telecommunications is better, that it will reduce overall healthcare costs. Um, so, you know, with, with this, I've shared this before, and again, we're, the pediatric community likes to share lots of different things. You can go to our website at UC Davis, and 18, we have 18 different pediatric referral guidelines. So if you want a one of our 18 pediatric subspecialists, you can click on links, and these are open to everybody. Up there, I have pediatric nephrology and transplant, pediatric infectious disease. It'll tell you a list of disorders that they will do over telemedicine, what they want before you know, if you want the CT scan or the CBC or the recent HMP, and so all of that is packaged. And it can really be, make the visit with the subspecialist efficient. They say, this is what I want before I'll see them. And all, it's almost sometimes more efficient than in person where they come and additional tests have to be ordered where there's no um, knowledge of what the specialist might want. So um, again, you can go to these our website there and uh, click these down. Uh, lots of people like to, like to use them. We also use it, so from outpatient, we have been growing our use of it with the inpatient setting. Um, we connect to several community hospital inpatient wards to provide pediatric subspecialty services. 
So the idea is if a child comes in with their third or fourth admission to asthma, they haven't seen a pulmonologist, allergist, something like that, you know, in our hospital, we would have a pulmonary consult. In their hospital, they either have to discharge them without patient follow-up or do a phone call, but now we're providing those services to that hospital. So the child ideally receives the same level of care that they would at these regionalized pediatric centers. <clears throat> we have two adult ICUs that admit not a lot of children, maybe uh, 60 uh, kids from zero to 18 per year in their, in their adult ICU. And that's, you know, before you throw tomatoes at me, I think that sometimes if it's a two and a half hour or three hour drive, it might be argued that that's an okay thing to do. For example, a child that's on the right trajectory with status asthmaticus that wants to just, you don't want to do a little bit more monitoring or continuous albuterol will help do that. Um, one of the hospitals is a level two trauma center, so they'll have an adolescent in there um, and we'll work with the trauma surgeons or an appendectomy that is perforated or something like that and do a little close monitoring and we'll help manage those patients in their local community that way. So it's really a, a win, win, win for the patient. We also have programs for in newborn nurseries and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> it took me about six weeks to come up with this acronym PNET, um, Pediatric Emergency Assistance to Newborns Using Telemedicine. Um, I'd like if you not steal that, but um, uh, for a pediatric program. And so I have a lot of videos. My kids make fun of me because they're like, Dad, you do show and tell um, as opposed to giving lectures or whatever. But this is an example. And this is a very old video, probably about like eight years old, but it, it, it's um, whether we like it or not, sometimes adolescent uh, kids are admitted to adult ICUs throughout the country and may not get the attentive care that we're used to giving adolescents in our ICU. And this is an adolescent girl that was admitted with toxic shock um, at an outside hospital here. And the audio on this one is a little bit low. Let me try and turn it up here. But that's okay. We don't need the audio on this one. Oh, thank you. Somebody in the back behind the curtain. Um, and our doc is able to see the ventilator there. That's the nurse in the Artini office. The doc was covering two hospitals. He was over at another hospital, so there wasn't an adult intensivist um, in the room. <clears throat> this is our low-tech way of getting the vital signs um, here, zooming in on the monitor. Certainly, you can have that stream. It's just more technology, more bandwidth, more money. Honestly, you can see the patient's hypotensive. He's able to evaluate chest rise on the patient. He's given recommendations on you know, decreasing the ventilation there a little bit. You're able, even able to evaluate things like capillary um, refill using this technology here. And it, again, this is, and that's in the ICU, we call that crummy capillary refill on our, our scale. Um, look at the blood pressure there. Our doc, you can see, he's kind of getting a little bit impatient, um, not happy, but he's... Eventually, this, the doc came, I'm going to skip it there, uh, transferred the child to our ICU. She walked out of the hospital. It was a good outcome, but there wasn't another... There wasn't a critical care physician immediately available there otherwise, and with this technology, we were able to kind of help in and, and fill that gap. This is about the PNET, our newborn nursery program. The idea behind that, the star there is UC Davis. Um, the idea is that we go to different types of nurseries. Some critical access hospitals that literally do 300 uh, deliveries a year, a very low number, up to uh, <clears throat> very large uh, community level CCS NICUs were our neonatologists are available. And the idea is that if a baby is unexpectedly premature, it gets, you know, I'm not a neonatologist, but, you know, has a de are depressed when they come out, and you're thinking about cooling all of these things, unexpected complications that you have an expert, a neonatologist, virtually at their bedside right when the baby comes out. And times, I think, that can be life-saving or, or brain-saving with these programs. And then sometimes our neonatologists hook up with pediatricians and communities where they have a, a nursery and they just, the baby's a little bit tachypnic or hypoglycemic and our, with the help of our neonatologists, they give some recommendations and help monitor that baby so that, again, they can be in their local community and stay with their mom. <clears throat> it's, again, with all of these programs, as you can imagine, we, like you, are in a competitive market. And when we provide services to these hospitals and to these uh, providers, doctors, nurses, 
they think of UC Davis because we're out to help the kids and the family and I'd be lying if I wouldn't you know, admit that, hey, we're going to build a stronger relationship with this hospital so that when a subspecialty service or transfer is needed, they come to us um, rather than our competition. This is another, I, I'm sure that uh, Debbie and uh, Dr. Saitu have seen this video over and over and again, it's an old video, um, not HD, everything's HD now, but of a baby that was born in this okay, community level NICU with SVT and they were going to intubate, transport, um, do all of that to the baby but our neonate, neonatologist said let me take a look and they're, we're going to shock the baby there so the pads are on. Doink. So again I joked that was only two joules, I shocked my kids with a lot more at home and then the baby goes from SVT to normal sinus rhythm. You can see in the monitor our cardiologist, she's a cardiologist and neonatologist uh, it's in her office. The neonatologist, no offense, never took his hands out of his pocket uh, for the whole procedure. Um, and that baby was able to be started on a beta blocker and went home and avoided the expensive transport and didn't have to come to our hospital, right? So a win, kind of a win, win, win. I remember that um, my boss at the team at this time came up and slapped me on the back and he says, if you keep this up, you're going to be out of a job. Um, and I think he was mostly joking, um, but the reality is, is of course, you know, we want to have our units filled for cost effectiveness and efficiency that way. So, but again, the relationship with this nursery is um, important to our hospital. I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, something that I've been working on for a number of years since 2000, and that's the use of having uh, video conferencing in emergency departments so that when a sick kid presents to an outside emergency department, we, they can have access to pediatric critical care physicians. A lot of programs like this across the country, there's probably 20 of them or 30 of them. You, it, it comes from the emergency medicine department in our hospital. It comes from the pediatric critical care physicians. Um, we have 32 sites scattered throughout Northern California. Honestly, 24 of them are very, very active, and I would say we probably get um, between one to you know, one to two consults a day now in our, our ICU that we're, where we're seeing the kid over video conferencing now um, in these emergency departments. We've really worked hard to integrate it into our existing flow process. So it's the 1-800-UCD for kids, whether they want to talk to us or do telemedicine. I make it easy for our doctors. So there's five places in our PICU where we're in-house 24-7 where the doctor can sit sit on her butt and with three clicks be connected to these places with a, a headset. Um, and our focus has been on smaller critical access hospitals like low volume, high impact, right? So it isn't, there's the community hospitals that see, you know, 60,000 ER visits a year, adult and peds, they probably are less likely to need help than a critical access hospital that sees 10 critically ill children a year where they like freak out. Um, but it doesn't do much for the vo our volume, right? So if we have all of these hospitals, but they're very low volume, so that's why, that's an excuse as to why the number isn't uh, so great. But again, we're in, this, in the many hundreds now. Um, a lot of my uh, research has been on evaluating the impact on this. We've done this um, where we've given surveys to the families of kids that where telemedicine was done for the consultation versus telephone, old school way. Um, and this is just three of the bars across the board when families see the video conferencing used, see the expert come into the bedside of the room, have conversations with the experts over video conferencing, their ER experience is higher than that. And they, they think that the, the Nurses are nicer, the doctors are nicer, they're smarter um, because of the video conferencing. We also ask the ER docs as well, and maybe it's because we're less rude or whatever, but uh, they think we're smarter. Um, like we say, what's the clinical competence of the person providing the subspecialty consultation? It's higher when video conferencing is used. I mean, again, probably it's the difference between a curbside versus a bedside consultation. There's also more frequent, you know, we're, because we're more involved when we use video conferencing, it takes longer than a telephone call. We're more likely to add to a change in diagnosis and medication or change in disposition. And this graph includes, okay, well, we don't need to fly this kid. We can use ground transportation. And uh, sometimes it works the other way. Um, 
We also, this was published in uh, 2013, um, where we measured quality of care and we blinded the, the charts. And we used this process called implicit review, where we reviewed the charts um, by PEM specialists, um, telemedicine, telephone, and no consultation. And there was a stepwise as you see, increase, yellow being telemedicine. So the highest quality of care was those where telemedicine was used, delivered in the emergency department. We also had two pediatric pharmacists, again, review all of these charts blinded to identify medication error, error rates. And this is adjusted for lots of different factors and a stepwise reduction in medication error rates among these kids when video conferencing is used. And again, for those of us that do a lot, it's not surprising. We're... Um, we're there and you're more involved than you are when you're on the telephone. And this is, applies for our hospitalists do it, our neonatologists do it, our critical care doctors do it, and they, they all say the same thing. Um, we've also done some studies that we can reduce the rate of inappropriate transfers. This is another publication and the idea is that, that you, you would expect that they should err on the side of safety. And if a kid is kind of sick and they're not sure, transfer the kid. That's a big deal to the family, displacing them and all of that stuff. So, um, and we're not there to say no to the kids at all, to uh, kids, but a lot of times we, if with reassurance with the family and the local providers, hey, they can either spend the night on their you know, five bed pediatric ward and call us with any questions or they're okay to go home and follow up with their PCP, things like that. I mean, we've enrolled the help of health economists um, from the UC Davis campus there that have done very elaborate, way, way over my head, health economic evaluations that include the cost of the equipment, what we pay for it, our techs to be on 24-7, all of this stuff. Um, and if you consider the fact that our hospital is way more expensive than the community hospital and then the helicopter rides are $20,000 a pop that year, there's significant savings with these um, Pro, uh, with these programs. The question is who saves the money, um, but that's a different, that's for a different slide. Well, this is a recent publication that just came out in pediatric critical care. We know in, in the ICU, um, have known for lots of years that when kids arrive to the ICU from outside emergency departments, they arrive more sick than they do when they come from our own children's hospital. Presumably that's because our ER colleagues, pediatric emergency medicine, uh, do a more comprehensive job stabilizing the child. I don't think that it's our, you know, children's hospital ERs are just admitting less sick children. The presumption is that they do a better job stabilizing these patients. Um, and so we did this where we compared among many of our telemedicine emergency departments how sick they arrived to our ICU. And we found that um, the non-telemedicine hospitals in the dark blue and yellow, uh, these are PRISM scores, so a, ra a rating of severity of illness, that they arrive to us less sick when they come to us from ERs that are using telemedicine. And again, you could argue that, hey, maybe they're just sending you wimpier kids, but we have data to show that I don't mean wimpier, you know what I mean, like less sick, but it's um, that they're sending less sick kids to us, but that's not the issue. I think the issue is that we help initiate appropriate therapies before they just uh, you know, ship them off to us. And we did a sub-analysis where we looked at a number of ERs over time uh, before and after the implementation of telemedicine, and the severity of illness on arrival decreased after the implementation of telemedicine. So this is another, again, I told you it's going to be a potpourri or mishmash here about school-based telemedicine from the primary care providers. We don't do this at UC Davis. I'm not sure if you're, uh, you all are familiar with it or do it here at UCLA. Other programs are doing it. There's big programs in a number of states. Texas is certainly a leader in this, and this is at a New York um, uh, University of Rochester and down below is Dr. Neil Herendine there, and he's one of the guys with Ken McConaughey who run this program, and they have this uh, program where they see children in daycare centers, um, schools, uh, elementary school, child care centers, and even group homes. They've done more than 14,000 of these consultations, and they've published a lot of very impressive data. Uh, one of the concerns is that you're gonna, if you give this at a daycare, and he tells stories like, 
you know, the mom will come in and say, hey, you know, Johnny, hey, would you mind calling the doc and have, having the doc look at Johnny's rash? Okay, bye, I'll see you at five after work. That there's a concern that it might actually increase utilization. So they've done a very, a number of elaborate studies looking at this. Um, and on the left is the match control case uh, with outpatient visits and ER visits. And on the right is a telemedicine cohort. Again, blue is uh, office visit. Uh, the orange is ER visit. And so what they see there is a slight reduction in the office visits, right? So if a kid has pink eye, you can not have to have them come into the office for the pink eye infection. And there is a reduction, 23% reduction in ER visits. Overall, they were, you know, it is a concern that there's more utilization. So if you include these telemedicines, they are calling upon health providers uh, more frequently than they are not. But again, if the goal, uh, they've done cost studies on this, as in, as you can imagine, Telemedicine is a lot cheaper than the ER, so that overall there's a significant cost savings uh, to this model, even though there's a little bit more utilization that way. The other thing I mentioned, again, remote patient monitoring, the home monitoring. So we do some of this at UC Davis, mostly on the adult side. Other folks do a lot more. And the, the, the key issue here is that, you know, on, across the board, including adults, 25% of the population utilize 75% of the cost. These are patients with chronic medical conditions. Same thing in the children's hospital, right? Kids with special health care needs are the big users of healthcare dollars and a lot of resources. And if there's a better way to monitor them at home, then that's the, the goal here to um, kind of help prevent hospitalizations, complications, urgent, urgent visits and things like that. And lower left, you have the, all these Bluetooth Wi-Fi enabled devices and you know, we have this um, building at, our, at UC Davis and there's a floor, it's like a, a mock home, um, home it's hospital to home model of care. It's School of Nursing is working with this. And the technologies are amazing. You know, you can see now there's these clips that go on the uh, iPhone there, like in the uh, lower right. And it's actually better than trying to look at through the otoscope myself. And you can show the parents these pictures like that. And then there in the upper right, they have these. Those, those are like aspirin tablets. It's just zoomed in. You can see them in the lower right. They're actual sizes, and they little have a little microchip on them. You put a little patch on the flank, and it, when you eat the pill, your acid dissolves the microchip, and that sends a signal. And so you're able to actually monitor that the patients are ingesting uh, these pills. They also ingest little microchips. But it's all of these. There's tons of tons of these apps and gadgets and things like that, right? And they have pins now where that'll measure your peak flow and um, uh, all of these things. And I think that the technology is a little bit ahead of how we know how to use it. And then the other thing is that the sad thing is, I guess, is that we don't really get paid to keep patients healthy, right? We get paid to take care of sick kids. And, um, you know, this, these go way back to 10 years ago in the New York Times writing stories about how Healthcare profits off of mismanagement of patients with diabetes, for example, right? You'll make a lot more money uh, doing their op uh, retinal surgery, amputation, vascular surgeries than you'll ever get um, by trying to keep them healthy and exercising in their glucose intact. So it's not incentivized, but um, where it is incentivized are places like the VA, right? Because if they save a dollar, that's a dollar that goes into their pocket. Um, and this is a little bit older data, but in 2014, 12% of vets in one way or another during the previous year had a telehealth encounter, uh, more than 2 million visits they've logged. And they've, this is, again, that now there's more than 100,000 patients in the VA system that are using these home health uh, uh, technologies to monitor. And there's different technologies, as you can imagine, peak flow for your COPD or pulse socks, glucometer for the diabetics, things like that, scales for those with congestive heart failure. Um, again, we have also used it for case conferencing. Again, this is, may not be necessarily telemedicine, but when we started, our, we had a new heart surgeon come to per, uh, town, and our CAF conferences were synergistically done with UCSF for about two years, we wean from that. But now, twice a week, our cancer center, we have a cancer care network center. We do um, our what's called tumor board virtually, and we hook up with five places twice a week on the adult side, primarily um, that way. And on the pediatric side, you know, we have our primary care network with different satellite offices with pediatricians and our 
uh, mental health, behavioral health folks help do education on ADHD, autism, things like that, on how, how helping them um, better manage their patient population, uh, you know, so that there's not an onslaught of uh, subspecialty referrals that way. So this leads into, how many of you have heard of Project ECHO? Um, okay, so that's good that there's not so many of you, but this, this is the idea originating at a university in New Mexico where a hepatologist, Dr. Aurora, he was the only hepatologist in the whole state treating hepatitis C. And as you would imagine, the care was terrible, um, not because of him, but he just couldn't see everybody. Not everybody would become for it's a, it's a big, big state that way. So he flipped the tables and he started using tele telemedicine instead of seeing patients to educate primary care provider networks, um, providers, adult family practitioners, internal medicine on evidence-based guidelines on the management of hepatitis C. And it was a New England Journal of Medicine publication on this where it showed that you know the number of patients overall that were being treated increased, viral loads were down, is just like a super duper success story. And it wasn't doing the old-fashioned to see your doctor over telemedicine, but it was educating primary care providers on this. And this is a little info commercial um, on the Project ECHO. Project Again. ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system, from university medical centers and other specialty care sites to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, Community providers learn from specialists, they learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO, changing the world fast. I, l I love her New Mexican accent. Um, and so... Part of the ECHO? The AAP is very involved with this. They have a big grant. We have a Project ECHO with pain management. There's a lot of different Project ECHOs for different chronic medical conditions where this uh, works very well, again, and it's on the adult side. Um, a number of states are participating in the AAP-supported Project um, um, ECHO, and again, the, this model of care. It makes a lot of sense in integrated health systems, like if it's Kaiser Intermountain Health, you know, they have a very large uh, Project ECHO program going on that way. But, and again, another idea, concept behind these as we get all of the mergers of the health systems and hospitals. So these are the six domains of the Institute of Medicine, quality of care, and I think that I could argue in a lot of ways that uh, the use of telemedicine and telehealth technologies can, you know, provide even safer care than if you rely on the old uh, model effective. It's certainly patient-centered. It can be argued that it's uh, timely, sometimes more efficient and equitable. Um, uh, it was, I guess it's been a little, maybe six months ago, nine months ago, the AAP put out this a technical report that I hope that you can look at. It has a lot of details on uh, te te the applications of telemedicine. And in the Committee on Pediatric Workforce, with which I'm a member of that, we put out one on telehealth, and that's more of a policy statement that we use in local legislators and, and national legislators in terms of what the AAP is advocating for um, in terms of telehealth. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of stuff like equal payment for providers and, um, and things like that. Is if you're not into those articles, you can go to the Wall Street Journal. This uh, came out within the last month. If you, uh, it was a big article in the Wall Street Journal on the left, how telemedicine is transforming healthcare. And if you get the New England Journal of Medicine, this is probably three weeks old. There, a review article on the state of telehealth. Um, so, but there are, you know, we've been talking telemedicine. There's a lot of barriers that still exist for sure. Um, the big one I mentioned before, aligning the investments with the savings. If we help keep patients healthy, 
we don't get paid necessarily to do that, unfortunately. Who's saving the money? Oftentimes it's the insurance company, um, and they're not so readily giving it back to the providers investing this time and effort. Equity and reimbursement, um, the equipment telecommunications personnel, it certainly takes a lot of program investment to be able to do that. There's certainly regulations like hospital credentialing and privileging. So with all of the places that we hook up with, there's really just one health system that hasn't adopted the credentialing by proxy structure, but otherwise we've had a lot of success with that. So our doctors don't have to be credentialed at 20 hospitals. We again use this, it's a process that uh, Debbie's very familiar with to credential them by using the proxy system. Um, other barriers, there's not a lot of doctors, nurses, therapists sitting on their hands going, gosh, I wish I had more patients or more work to do. Um, and that's a serious issue. Everybody's busy. Uh, so engaging the physicians and engaging the consumers is also seen as a barrier. And even though we've been, you know, we've, I say we've been very successful in our ICU, my docs now are like, where does so-and-so have telemedicine? We need to get them telemedicine. It would help so much with this patient. And they actively like, oh, an 18-month-old breathing hard? Before I tell you what I think you should do, let me take a look at the baby and talk to the mom and things like that. And it's, again, I, um, I don't want to like be mean about it, but it's kind of like if you're going to see a patient in your ER, do you want to do it with your eyes closed or do you want to do it with your eyes closed open? And it's not a big, we may, we've made it so it's literally three clicks of a mouse for us to be able to hook up to these sites. So um, our docs have it very well integrated in their process flow. Now there's proactive, but it wasn't always like that. This is an e email from the font is good, which is probably a good thing from my colleague where I was like, hey, do telemedicine if you get a call from this site. And, I meant to scrub out his name, John Holcroft. He's a colleague, partner, great intensivist here. He goes, I did another, and he said stinking, but I just, I didn't want to offend anybody. Uh, so I blotted out stinking telemedicine consultation or whatever. So again, it was a culture change um, to be able to incorporate this, and they weren't always the most receptive. You want me to what? Uh, whining doctors. Um, but now I, I'm very happy to say that they are like, hey, I want, I want to use this. Let me take a look at that child. Which again, I think is just just the right. It's the right thing to do. Um, so f these are common questions about reimbursement. So for Medicare, there is reimbursement for telemedicine for a limited number of subspecialties, but it's very restrictive. It has to be the originating site where the patient is has to be in a, a HIPSA area, things like that. They only do store and forward for uh, um, Hawaii and Alaska. Medicaid is left up to the states. More than half of the states here, this is a map, I think from the AAP, uh, that shows the blue ones that have parity laws that say, okay, if you're gonna pay for in-person, you have to pay for telemedicine as well. It's the same payment, same code, just with a modifier on the CPT that way. These are the Medi-Cal codes that are, um, that are reimbursed, um, and we actually do additional codes. When, if, ever, if we do something over telemedicine, even if it's not in the Medi-Cal range, we still submit that, and usually those are actually paid. I have the telephone number of, um, that's the advantage of being in Sacramento, of the folks in CCS that are able to write the exceptions on the codes for Xerox uh, for reimbursement, because there's some, Believe it or not, in our state government, we have some rules to say, okay, you should get paid for this, but the regulations are that you only pay for such and such. And so I've been trying to get them to match those things up for quite some time. Um, it isn't great. You know, there's originating sites, right? So facility fees, you lose out on a facility fee if the patient comes, doesn't come to you. Medi-Cal does pay a $22.94 uh, originating facility site for the originating site, so it wouldn't come to uh, the referral center. And then they even pay for transmission, and it's $0.24 cents per minute um, is what they pay for these things. But we do it on all of our patients. Uh, everyone that we do telemedicine for, we ask for this uh, $3 in, in telecommunications reimbursement this way. Um, and then, so the models for reimbursement, a lot of it is fee for service, um, uh, but more, uh, some of it's contracted. About five years ago, it used to be 75% uh, fee for service, so we would just do it just as if we saw a patient in our clinic. Now it's probably about 75 uh, contracted, and you know those are hourly rates. Again, this is typically with uh, FQHCs or rural health clinics where the financial model makes sense to do contracted rates. 
quick, quick uh, common questions about liability. Like, I don't want to see a patient and get sued. Well, if you see a patient, you're going to get sued anyways. And hopefully, if you see them by video, you're less likely to get sued. And there's actually lawsuits coming out now in the adult world where stroke patients go to an emergency department. They don't have a stroke neurologist. They don't get TPA. They have a bad outcome. And now those hospitals are getting sued because, hey, Telestroke is everywhere, and there's no, not having that subspecialty service immediately available to your hospital. Um, so none of these that I'm familiar with have been have gone to court and have been awarded, but there's certainly um, suits underway this way. A state licensure, not a big issue for us in the state of California, but we do some stuff over state and have to get uh, state license, licenses in other states that way. Um, and again, I mentioned the credentialing by proxy. So the other thing um, I kind of really uh, briefly in the last like five minutes is go through with um, direct consumer telemedicine. This I got off of the web here, a, a commercial. Nights like these are far less stressful than they used to be. It was so easy. I was able to connect to a doctor without leaving the house. That's so easy. I logged into my son's account and followed the simple point and click instructions to schedule an appointment. From the list of pediatricians, I selected one that had the option to visit now and available by video. On the next screen, I entered earache as the reason for the appointment. Shortly after the appointment was placed, I got a text and an email notification that the pediatrician was ready to see Jason again. We connected to him through a video for consultation, where he asked detailed questions about his symptoms. Jennifer, from the good history you've given me and the reaction <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. It's commonly known as swimmer's ear. I'm going to prescribe antibiotic ear drops, which you can pick up at your local pharmacy. If his condition worsens or he does not improve, please consult with your child's pediatrician. Have I answered all your questions? <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Abelwitz. So it's, um, when my, I was like, it was funny, I was practicing a talk with this video, and my wife was like, oh, my God, I want that. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's like terrible. It's like, I'm a pediatrician. She's like, you're not a pediatrician. <laughs> You're an ICU doctor. That video caused, you know, we nearly got divorced um, fighting over that. Um, but the, it's, it's all about cost savings. Health plans, if they can do this and avoid an ER visit, if they do 20 of these and avoid one ER visit, they're going to come out ahead, right? Everybody's doing it. The five largest health plans in the country all have this. Um, Debbie was telling me now, even with her health plan here, you can, you can see MD Live or whatever this way. I love the racial ethnic diversity in our advertising there. Um, and why not? You know, the docs, this is, I get an email probably about every two months like, hey, earn $100,000 in just two hours a day. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, and they sit around, and I know, I don't know if you guys know, I don't want you to raise your hand if you do this, because I will call you out. Um, but, you know, literally an ER doc I was talking to you probably about three months ago, and he goes, oh, yeah, he says, I made $80,000 doing this last year, and all I do is dole out antibiotics to parents and people with colds. And he was, he was very happy about it and proud of it. Um, but it's probably not the best care, right? And they treat UTIs, ear infections. How do you treat an ear infection? They picked, they're smart, they picked otitis externa for the video, but they say they treat ear infections over the phone, over video this way, or a UTI, or a throat culture, or things like that. There's real issues here, of course. Physician-patient relationship, access to the medical record, limited physical exam, no diagnostic testing, quality and safety, right? And then they say, hey, we're going to email you something. Please share it with your provider. But when they've done surveys, nobody shares it with the provider because you're cheating on your doc, right? So they don't want to say, hey, I got more antibiotics. You wouldn't let me have antibiotics for my cold, you know, eh. So, and then it's not really fair care, too. For those of us that are in telemedicine, we've always seen, hey, telemedicine, we can reach children in rural and underserved communities, right? This is like our mission, right? Pediatrician, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's like, who gets this? It's basically employer-based, privately insured People, this is not your, you know, Medi-Cal folks can't pay the $70 that it requires. That's the copay uh, to be able to do things like this. So the idea that all of a sudden 
business is stealing our technology to increase disparities and, and things like that is pretty up, up, upsetting to us. But again, we get squished because there's investment bankers have more money. Um, and then there's a lot of pediatricians do this now, right? You get phone calls, you get iPhones. It's like, you get paid? No, but Dr. Abelwitz does. And my buddy making $80,000 a year does doing this. So we have to, um, and again, there's a concern about increased utilization. So uh, okay, quick. Um, there's some data on this. Um, mostly it's in adults. And it's as you'd imagine. This was done by Laura Usher Pines out of uh, Pittsburgh. Um, and they looked at 99 visits for women coming in with complaints of UTI symptoms and compared it to, you know, the in person 2,800. And on the left, you say the incidence of urine, UA, or culture, I think it was at 13% of the docs when you call by video, one in your analysis versus 50% in person. 99% of the patients that called by video got antibiotics versus 50% in person. The sad thing is, is that it was still cheaper to do the e-visit. Amoxicillin, Septra is cheap, going to a doctor's office, doing the culture, that's actually more expensive. So how the insurance companies plan to use, you know, if they want to save money, um, or whatever, I don't want to get uh, sued. Um, this was a funny uh, clip that we have posted in our emergency <laughs> department. <laughs> Um, and then there's another study that's a little bit more recently, also uh, Laura Usher Pines, where they looked at uh, 4,600 uh, telehealth visits. And this is with CalPERS, as you know, this is the, is it the largest um, public employee retirement program in the, in the country, if not the second, I think it's the first largest. Um, and they looked at a number of HEDIS measures. And one first one is avoiding antibiotics for acute bronchitis. We don't do this great in person, right? 28% of the times we avoid antibiotics should be higher. But if you do it over e-visits, 17% of the time they avoid an antibiotic. So they're, again, quote unquote, doling out antibiotics. The same, another HEDIS measure of doing testing, a strep test for uncomplicated pharyngitis, 50% in a person. And as you can imagine, if you call your doc over the iPad, they're not going to go, oh, go to your doctor and get a strep test. They're going to probably just give you antibiotics. And then on a kind of a little bit similar-ish vein, you know, retail-based clinics, to a certain degree, there's some overlap with this. You know, easy access, easier access care. This was a just came out in Health Affairs in 2016. Hit NPR, which is where I get all my um, medical information, uh, where they looked at these retail-based clinics and the you know 13 million Aetna enrollees in 22 big cities, a big population. This is not the greatest graph here, but what they find is that if you make the access super duper easy, you do run the risk of increasing utilization. So in their analysis, 58% of these Minute Clinic was considered new utilization. That if, hey, if they didn't have that, they probably just wouldn't have done anything. They would have dealt with their cold and things like that. 42% um, of it was substitution. That's probably, maybe it's a good thing, right? Not going to the doctor's office or emergency department. Or no, I'm sorry, they had like, it was a 5%. Uh, 7% re reduction in emergency department visits. So we still have to figure it out um, on how these are used. And, you know, there's the business side of it where they invested hundreds of millions of dollars in these um, online applications and um, cost savings and things like that. So a lot to kind of figure out with data. Uh, in conclusion, I think that telemedicine, if used right, can help with the triple aim, you know, population health, increase the experience and convenience for the patients, and reduce overall health care costs. Um, their applications are, are booming. They're using it everywhere. There's certainly barriers that remain. I think to an increasing demand, uh, to an increasing, an increasing degree, consumers are demanding it, right? The forgive me, but the younger generation with their iPads and Skyping and things like that, that's the way they're going to kind of expect to see their uh, healthcare providers. But there certainly can be threats to the medical home with these new technologies, at least on the outpatient or direct-to-consumer care home setting. And so there's 53, I went three minutes over. So thank you very much.